Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We'd love to have you. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 1. And as we ended our last lesson, I asked you to take a home assignment and read 1 Kings chapter 11 because that would help you understand what's about to happen in chapter 10 of 2 Chronicles a lot better. If we just went from uh, the end of chapter 9 in 2 Chronicles, Solomon died, it would be leaving you in the dark as to why what happened in chapter 10 of 2 Chronicles came to pass. And if you followed my request and read the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, you learn several things. Uh, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Many of those were foreign. And what does that mean? That means they worshiped other gods. You had the Ammonites, the Moabites, their gods, uh, Chemosh and Molech. Uh, you had Ashtaroth, all the different gods of the heathen nations. Uh, Solomon's wives made little altars even on the Temple Mount. And Solomon fell into the seduction of worshiping idols. God had appeared to Solomon in a dream on two different occasions. And I mean, how could someone's faith be shaken after God had spoken with them in a dream? I just don't understand that. I guess it's the, uh, the power of being the king and then the foreign influence of the wives were what got Solomon down. It made God very angry, and rightly so. Uh, and he promised Solomon that he was going to break the stick, as it's called in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. The stick is now broken even unto this day. But when Ezekiel 37 and 38, the prophecies therein are fulfilled, the two sticks will be rejoined. But that's what happens in, in chapter 10. The nation is torn apart. Why? Because of Solomon's idolatry. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. And we ask you to open eyes, open ears today as we pick it up with the reign of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 10, verse 1, and it reads, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to make him King. The ten tribes came to anoint him king and to pay homage to him, uh, will they? Important to realize, too, Shechem is located in the tribe, the boundaries of Ephraim. And Jeroboam, whom, if you read chapter 11 of 1 Kings, as I requested, you learn that the prophet Ahiah uh, came to Jeroboam, uh, ripped his own garment in 12 pieces, and instructed Jeroboam to take 10, uh, representing 10 of the tribes of Israel. Uh, Jeroboam was of Ephraim. In fact is, uh, he had, Solomon knew Jeroboam. He, he saw that he was industrious. Uh, the Ephraimites and the Manassites were working on Milo, the wall that Solomon built. And it was labor. They, were, they weren't doing their own jobs at home, making a living for their families. They were in Jerusalem building walls for Solomon. And they were oppressed a bit. I mean, Solomon had quite a building appetite, you see. And uh, Jeroboam knew in advance that he had, was chosen by God to lead the ten tribes. Now, did he share that with the other people of the ten tribes? Well, let's find out. Verse 2. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. 
No doubt the Ephraimites sent word to Jeroboam that Solomon had passed away. And of course, he fled to Egypt because Solomon wanted to kill him. Uh, when he heard that, and when, when Solomon learned that Jeroboam was going to take 10 of the, the tribes out of his kingdom, uh, he was quite upset and wanted to kill Jeroboam. God promised Jeroboam just as he had promised Saul, just as he had promised David, just as he had promised Solomon that if you'll walk my way, uh, I'm going to bless you and things are going to go good for you and I'll establish your kingdom forever. The same promise that he made to Saul, David, and Solomon. Uh, Jeroboam, Jeroboam didn't uh, meet the conditions either. And more on that as we work our way through this lesson. Verse 3, And they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Now what they're going to ask for is that the burdens that Solomon had placed on them be eased up a bit, to ease up on the building appetite and don't be taxing us so much. Because uh, Solomon, like I said, had a, quite a building appetite and he, didn't, he wasn't bashful about making people in his kingdom help him. Uh, the people were oppressed. You remember when they were building the house of God and, and Solomon's own palace and the house of the, of the forest of Lebanon. They sent people from Israel every third month to work for a month cutting down trees. Again, that was taken away from their making livings for their family. So uh, this was getting a bit uh, hard on the people of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and they're going to ask Sol excuse me, Rehoboam to ease up their burdens a bit. This is I Israel and Jeroboam to Rehoboam. Thy father, referring to Solomon, made our yoke grievous, or heavy, you could translate this. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father, and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. Solomon had placed great demands on the people to support his voracious building appetite. Now, if you're a, a, a fan of Solomon, uh, you might think that Jeroboam and the ten northern tribes are forgetting the blessings that Solomon brought to the nation of Israel under his reign. And they were blessed. Uh, they, they were successful, prosperous uh, under the reign of Solomon, particularly in Solomon's early years when he was doing things God's way. The lesson of Chronicles, do things God's way, receive his blessings. If you don't, don't receive his blessings, you receive his cursings. Verse 5, And he said unto them, Come again unto me after three days. And the people departed, Jeroboam, and the ten representatives of the ten tribes left. And Rehoboam saying, Give me three days to uh, consider this. And he's also, going. we're going to see, uh, consult uh, counselors, two different sets of counselors to be exact. Verse 6, and King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? This people referring to the ten tribes of Israel and Jeroboam. Now, these folks, the elders, the, the old men that stood before Solomon, not one of them could match the wisdom of Solomon. Why? Because Solomon's wisdom was God-given. But these advisors witnessed the wisdom of Solomon and learned from Solomon, uh, I'm sure. So uh, these people had witnessed Solomon's decision-making firsthand. Verse 7, And they spake unto him, this being the uh, older, the elders, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. If you'll 
just ease up a little bit on the burdens, or quit taxing them so heavily, don't require them to come and leave their uh, occupations where they can support their family uh, to work for uh, the government, basically, the nation. And, uh, and they'll serve you and, and things will go well for you. But he, Rehoboam, forsook or rejected the counsel which the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. He's listening to his old school chums, school buddies. And remember, this generation had grown up in peace. Not one of these uh, younger had ever even served in the military, most likely, uh, or had seen war and, and the effects of war on a nation. And uh, young people, too, have a tendency to uh, think that they are invincible. I know that when I was 18 or so, I thought I was invincible. And uh, when I was 21 or so, I came to my senses. But young people don't always make good decisions. They're not going to make good decisions here either, but that's all in God's control as well. Verse 9, And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people? which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. The, the older folks say that you should uh, ease the yoke and treat the people fairly and speak kind words to them and things will go well. What, what do you say? And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter or easier for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now, without going into great detail about the male anatomy, uh, let me suffice to say that what they're telling Rehoboam to say is that I'm more powerful than my father. In other words, there's more power in my little finger than in my father's loins. And it sounds like the counsel that uh, young men might give. Verse 11, For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. I'm not going to ease your burdens. I'm going to increase your burdens. My father chastised you with chip, whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Now, what a scorpion is, at this time, a whip was made most often out of leather straps. And what they would do is take a wire and run it through the end of the straps and then twist it, uh, making kind of a barb, if you will. So rather than just the leather causing damage when you hit someone with it, these scorpions would hurt like the sting of a scorpion, thus the name of this particular piece of uh, torture equipment. Verse 12, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king bade, saying, Come again to me on the third day. What is your decision, Rehoboam? I mentioned earlier that Jeroboam already knows that God has given him ten tribes out of the twelve tribes of Israel. Rehoboam, if you translate it, means uh, that a people has enlarged. Unfortunately, uh, Rehoboam is about to see the number of people in his kingdom reduced because God promised Solomon that he was going to, uh, to split the nation in two and that's exactly what is going to come to pass. God's uh, prophecies always come to pass just as exactly as they're spoken or written. Verse 13, and the king answered them roughly. This means that he, he answered them severely or cruelly as, as a tyrant might. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men. Rehoboam's folly 
is right in line with God's plan. Uh, the prophecy of Ahiah is about to be fulfilled. Ahiah prophesied this in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 29, and the following verses. The nation is going to be split. 14, and answered them after the advice of the young men. This is Rehoboam to Jeroboam and the representatives, the leaders of Israel. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. The young advisors are fueling Rehoboam's ambitions. Um, and note, though, that he left out the part about there's more power in my little finger than in my father's loins. This was all Jeroboam and Israel needed to hear. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God. God was in control of all of this, that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahiah, the Shilonite, meaning he was from Shiloh, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam was to be king over the ten tribes of Israel. Uh, Ahiah, the prophet, uh, came to Jeroboam, caught him in a field, and tore his own garment in twelve pieces and told uh, uh, Jeroboam to take ten. He would be the king over the ten northern tribes become known as Israel, meaning the ten tribes. Judah would remain with the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 16, And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? And we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. And now, David, see to thine own house. So all Israel went to their tents. They all went home. They left, in other words. There were deep-rooted jealousy among the Ephraimites and the ten northern tribes in general toward Judah. Uh, since the blessings of Jacob were given out to his sons in Genesis chapter 49, uh, the blessing on Judah was that the, uh, the scepter, the king's scepter, in other words, the king's ship would not pass from the house of Judah. And uh, that caused deep-rooted jealousies that were only briefly quenched by King David and King Solomon. Now, of course, David had been uh, passed away several decades <clears throat> before this event came about. When they say, what portion or what allotment have we in David, they're saying, what do we have to do with Judah? There, there's nothing for us from Judah, and we don't expect anything. Basically what they're saying is, Judah, you mind your own business, and we'll be happy to mind our own business. The nation is split. Verse 17, But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Now it was quite all right for uh, people who lived, uh, people of different tribes, to live within uh, the allotted territory of another tribe. Uh, there were people of the ten northern tribes who lived in the cities of Judah. In fact, it is there were about to be a whole lot more of them coming to reside in the territory of Judah and Benjamin because Jeroboam took off and created his own new religion. Things were not going well for the ten northern tribes. Uh, the priests, the Levites, were the first to leave the ten northern tribes due to the antics of Jeroboam. More on that in a moment. Verse 18. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram that was over the tribute. Now, Hadaram is a tax collector. Let me ask you, how well do you think the ten northern tribes are going to receive Hadaram, who is sent 
to tell them how much taxes they're going to pay to uh, King Rehoboam. And the children of Israel stoned him with stones that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Rehoboam barely escaping with his own life. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Now, uh, that was the reason that God split the nation. Why did it happen? Because of the idolatry of Solomon. And some people might say, well, you know, it was Solomon who committed idolatry. What, what did Rehoboam do? It looks like the son is being punished for the sins of the father. No, God doesn't work that way. Yes, Solomon was guilty of committing idolatry, but we're going to learn in the next several verses or chapters that Rehoboam was not far behind his father in the idolatry compartment. Also, what do we see in, there's more power in my little finger than in my father's loins. And uh, my father chastised you with whips. I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. That's arrogance. And God does not like arrogant people. Uh, God likes humble people. Let's see if Rehoboam learns a lesson. Chapter 11, verse 1. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin an hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, a hundred and eighty thousand fighting men, which were warriors to fight against Israel, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. Now, uh, Rehoboam had seen his tax collector Hadaram stoned to death. He'd been uh, barely escaped with his own life and he's been rejected by the, the ten northern tribes in Jeroboam, he's angry, he, he's mad, and he's looking to get revenge. <clears throat> he thinks that he doesn't realize, though, that it's God's plan that is important. It's not his plan that is important. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, uh, the man of God, saying, Shemaiah uh, was a prophet of God. Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah. Note that he said to Rehoboam, king of Israel. No, he said to Rehoboam, king of Judah. The nation has been split. And to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, God said that he would leave uh, a few tribes for, to keep the light of his favorite servant David's burning, and the rest would be stripped away. And again, these Israel in Judah are the people of other tribes who live within the cities of Judah and Benjamin. <clears throat> a people enlarged, Rehoboam has become a people reduced. Verse 4, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me, the Lord speaking. And they obeyed the words of the Lord, that's always a good thing to do, and returned from going against Jeroboam. Chastisement for the apostasy of Solomon and also the arrogance and the idolatry of Rehoboam. Verse 5, And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. This built means that he uh, rebuilt or fortified. And we're going to see that there are 15 locations. And as we go through them, I'm going to point out uh, where they lie geographically. There, there's a common uh, tie. And he built even Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Palestine was the birthplace of Benjamin and uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Etam in southern Judah. And Tekoa, Tekoa near Hebron, and therefore south of Jerusalem. And Beth Zur, this protects uh, Jerusalem from the south. 
and Shoko, 10 miles southwest of Hebron, even further south of Jerusalem, and Adullam. Adullam, you may recall, is where uh, David, when he was fleeing from uh, Saul, uh, hid out in the cave Adullam. <clears throat> and Gath, a uh, strong position between Judah and the Philistines. And Marisha uh, in the low country, and Ziph, another hiding place for David. And Adarim, Adarim west of Hebron, uh, and Lachish and Azekah uh, near uh, Shoko, uh, again, all of these south of Jerusalem. And Zorah, Zorah was the home of Samson, you may recall, one of our judges, and Aijalon, which was a city of refuge, and Hebron, which lie to the south of Jerusalem, which are in Judah, and in Benjamin fenced cities, 15 uh, fortified cities to protect against attacking peoples. Now, if uh, Rehoboam had a premonition that the, if he were going to be attacked, it would seem to me that he would be thinking that an attack would come from the 10 northern tribes of Israel. But he's building up and fortifying south of Jerusalem, not north of Jerusalem, which is where you would fortify to defense against the ten tribes. But I think he has a feeling that he's going to have problems with Egypt. And we're going to learn in the next several chapters that he's absolutely right. He is going to have trouble from Egypt. Remember where Jeroboam went when he fled from Solomon because he was for feared for his life? He went to Egypt. Well, he made some friends while he was in Egypt. Verse 11, and he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and store of victual, that's supplies that might, might be needed. He's stockpiling munitions and supplies and oil and wine. Verse 12, and in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. He distributed uh, weapons and supplies throughout these fortified cities uh, to the south of Jerusalem, uh, storing them up in case they're needed at a different time, a later time. Now in the next several verses, we change gears. We're going to switch over to what Jeroboam did just as soon as he became the, the king of the ten northern tribes after the nation split. It's not good. Verse 13, And the priest and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him, referring to Rehoboam, out of all their coast. Now, what Jeroboam, one of the first things he did was he put a golden calf in Bethel and Dan. And he told the people of the ten northern tribes, you don't need to go down to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. You can worship these two golden calves here in Dan and Bethel. Kind of reminds me of people today telling people, you know, you don't really need to understand the book of Revelations. Uh, beware of anyone who tells you you don't need to understand part of God's Word. Uh, beware of those who uh, make up their own religions. They're, they're playing church. Uh, Jeroboam is playing church. But the Levites left the suburbs where they resided among the ten northern tribes and uh, fled to Judah. Verse 14, And the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. The priest would have no part of the golden calves of Jeroboam, and they fled. Uh, the, any, anyone that had a righteous bone in their body fled from the ten northern tribes 
and moved to Jerusalem, or at least Judah and uh, uh, Benjamin. Now this Jeroboam and his sons, plural, is a little confusing to some. Uh, you see, uh, Jeroboam only had one son. He didn't have multiple sons. And as God had promised Jeroboam that he would develop his throne forever if he would do things God's way. Well, he didn't do things God's way. And the seed line of uh, Jeroboam was cut off. Uh, there was only one son that would even go to the throne of the ten northern tribes, but he was killed uh, very shortly thereafter. Verse 15, And he ordained him priest for the high places, not Levites, and here he's ordaining his own priest, and for the devils, these are the hairy ones, if you will, uh, the, the uh, goats that the Egyptians worshipped, and for the calves which he made, those golden calves at uh, Bethel and Dan. Jeroboam would make anyone who wanted to be a priest a priest. It kind of reminds me of the 90-day wonders coming out of the cemeteries, I mean the seminaries today. They crank them out, uh, but they don't know God's Word. You can't teach God's Word if you don't know God's Word. But Jeroboam is making up his own religion as he goes. He even went so far as to move the seven-day feast that God ordained on the seventh month, Tishri, to the eighth month. And, uh, and then again, he was appointing his own priest. Jeroboam even switching that feast day. Many in the ten northern tribes became very concerned about the, the movement of the nation away from God. As I said earlier, anyone with a righteous bone in their body fled uh, to uh, Judah and also uh, uh, the, the tribe of Benjamin. But when, when you see the nation going away from the law of Moses, as these people did, Jeroboam uh, appointing his own priest, moving the appointed feast days. And Moses didn't appoint those feast days. The Lord appointed those feast days. You know, it's not much difference today. We have churches that teach that Eve took a bite out of an apple, and that is what caused all the problems in the Garden of Eden. You have people that are what's the highest Sabbath of the year, supposed to be the highest Sabbath of the year, the Passover. And they have their children out rolling Easter eggs in the groves, uh, a pagan uh, spring orgy. Uh, you have people teaching rapture theory instead of truth. You move away from God's Word and you lose focus. Uh, things are not going to go well for your nation when that comes to pass. Well, how will all this turn out? Come back in our next lesson and we'll find out uh, it's not good for Rehoboam or Jeroboam. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the U.S. and Canada. 
If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. I say possibly be answered on the air. This program goes into millions of homes around the world. We simply can't answer all the questions that come to us, but I know this, if the Holy Spirit wants your question to be here, it will. So uh, please don't ask for answers to, to questions in writing. Uh, we have a very limited staff that accomplish a lot of work for the Lord, but we don't have enough sufficient staff to answer every biblical question that people would like a written answer to. The only format is right here on the air by one of the pastors. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. I encourage you to talk to your Heavenly Father. He's there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, it makes his day when you talk to him. A lot of people, I'm afraid, these times uh, and this time uh, don't have time for Father. They're running here, running there, running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And they don't have time for God. But it makes his day when you take time to communicate with him. And you can do it through prayer. And I encourage you to do that. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs. We have uh, illnesses, Father. We have injuries. Father, we ask for that touch of healing. Uh, you know the needs of all these, Father. We also raise up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, touch, guide, and heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks. First up, we have uh, Bobby in Kansas. Is Jesus God now that he's in heaven or is he still the Son? Mark, uh, six, Mark 16, 19, I should say. Uh, he is the Lamb of God and he sits at the right hand of God. But having said that, you know, you need to understand the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it states that a virgin will conceive, and she'll have a son, and you'll call his name Emmanuel. If you translate Emmanuel, it means God with us. And that kind of summarizes the office of Jesus Christ. And if that doesn't, Yeshua certainly will. The Hebrew name for Joshua, Yeshua, is Yahweh's Savior. That was his mission as the Son of Man, Jesus Christ in the flesh. So uh, Jesus would tell the disciples in uh, the, uh, the, the, the Gospel of John in John 14, If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So. Uh, I know that's a lot to absorb, but uh, hang in there with it. William in Alabama, do you think if you were in the hospital on life support and you told them to turn it off, would God hold that against you as a sin? No. Uh, medical advances today have made it possible, I think, to keep people alive much longer than what uh, they would have a hundred years ago. Uh, people, they put them on ventilators that breathe for them. Uh, they put them on heart pumps that pump the blood through their system for them and basically are just keeping them hanging on uh, barely to life. Uh, I don't think that God intended for us to live on ventilators and heart pumps so when it's time to go home, it's time to go home. And there's absolutely nothing wrong uh, with uh, turning the pump off and the ventilator off when it's time. You know, William, it's important that you communicate your wishes with your family uh, so that they know when something happens to you. It might be, be that you become incapacitated and, and you're not even able to communicate your own wishes. So uh, they have what is known as a living will 
and I would suggest that you fill one of those out so that you can, and you know, those are really valuable because they ease the burden on your family. If your family knows what your wishes are, they don't have as hard a time making the hard decisions to turn the equipment off. Pray about it. Janice in Oklahoma, I would like a study on three world ages. How do I get one? Okay, it's critical uh, importance that you understand the three world ages. There is absolutely no way that you're going to understand all of God's Word unless you understand the three world ages. As Paul would say, I know you know the mysteries of God. And part of the mysteries of God, or at least it's a mystery to some, are the three world and three heaven ages. Um, every monthly newsletter that we send out, Janice, you have on page three a list of suggested studies for new students. And if you don't know where to start, start there. And that'll give you the basic foundation to build your, your religious education on. So uh, one of the studies on that list, because that's, we consider those studies to be that important that they're on that list, is called Three World Ages. It's our CD number 30506. Leon in Georgia, I got a divorce and went my own way and I didn't take care of my two kids. After five years, I came back. Do you think God will forgive me for those five years that I didn't do what was right? Well, Leon, if you uh, repent and ask for his forgiveness, those sins will be blotted out completely and, and he won't even want to hear about them anymore. You know, a big part of forgiveness is learning how to forgive yourself or realizing how important it is to forgive yourself, especially if you're a Christian. I think Christians have a difficult time forgiving themselves. Why? They can't believe that they fell so badly and did something so terrible. Uh, and they can't believe God will forgive them. They have a, a guilty conscience about it. But forgiveness also means forgiving yourself. God doesn't want you walking around with a load of sins on your shoulders and a guilty conscience uh, to match. Uh, that's the beauty of Christianity. You can repent, which means a true change of heart, meaning that you don't want to continue in the ways that you were doing. You won't want to exhibit the behavior that you exhibited and you want to change. And if you'll do that and ask for forgiveness, uh, there's not, it's not possible that anyone has committed the unforgivable sin at this point in time. Jerry in Arkansas, when we die, can we see who all comes to our funeral? No, I don't believe so. Uh, we are in a different dimension uh, from the Lord and the Lord is in a different dimension from us and those who are with the Lord are in His dimension and not in ours. I don't believe uh, just as we can't see or hear into that dimension, I don't believe unless God ordains it that uh, they can see or hear into this dimension. Iris in North Carolina, how will we know the seventh trump is sounded? Well, uh, we should pinch yourself. And Iris, if you're still in the flesh, the seventh trump has not sounded. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 and the following verses say, when the last trump, that's the seventh trump, the one that's farthest out is what it means in the Greek, has sounded, uh, then the uh, corruptible must take on incorruptible. And in the twinkling of an eye, our flesh uh, where it is no more. We're in our spiritual bodies. So uh, if someone is standing in before you claiming to be Jesus Christ and you pinch yourself and you're still in the flesh, that's a fake standing in front of you, I'll assure you. Anne in Texas, I study every day. What I do not understand is if God came as Jesus, into the world. Why would Satan tempt God for 40 days knowing you can't tempt God? Uh, Luke 4, 2 and 4, 12. 
Well, Satan knows the Word of God. He just doesn't believe parts of it. And he thinks he's that good. Uh, you know, he's tried many, many times to destroy the seed line through which Jesus Christ would come. He, he knew that if he could keep Jesus from coming, that he would win because Messiah, Jesus Christ, why did he come to the earth in the flesh? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He came to, to defeat uh, he who has the power of death, that is to say, the devil. And as a result, uh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Uh, just as Jesus resurrected, we resurrect as well. Uh, Dale from Missouri, he's, he still thinks he's that good though, and he's going to take some with him. You want him to into the lake of fire, I'm talking about. You want to make sure you're not one of the ones that he uh, cons into going and deceives into going into the lake of fire with him. Dale in Missouri, I'm having a hard time getting over the past. I know God has forgiven me, but I'm having a hard time forgiving myself. And we talked about that on a previous question. Um, Pastor Arnold Murray did a work uh, several, many years ago entitled Forgiveness. And it's CD, it sounds like I'm selling COD, CDs today, I'm not. But that's Forgiveness is CD number 30425. And it has a, a big part to do that CD with forgiving yourself and how important that is. <clears throat> Make a note of Acts uh, chapter 3, verse 19, and it states there to repent that your sins may be blotted out. And that word in the Greek, blotted out, it means that if you took a piece of chalk and wrote on the chalkboard what your sin was, then you took an eraser and erased it, that sin's not there anymore. That's what blotted out means. It's though you never committed that sin and God doesn't want to hear about it anymore because when you keep bringing it up over and over and over with God, he starts thinking that you didn't, didn't believe that he had the power to forgive you for that. So very important to forgive yourself. Kenneth in California, uh, is David supposed to come back before the Antichrist? No, David uh, isn't coming back. Um, well, he might come back uh, in a spiritual body with God's army or Jesus' army in Revelation chapter 19, but David's not coming back uh, to earth in the flesh as it's written in Acts, uh, what is it, chapter 2 and 3, that David's flesh saw corruption. He went into the grave and his flesh stayed there. Uh, Jesus' uh, flesh did not see corruption. He didn't stay in the grave. He resurrected. Then you follow with what is an example of divine mercy. Well, mercy uh, means favor or kindness in the Bible. Um, oftentimes, you know, we deserve from God a lot more uh, severe punishment than what we actually get. I think that would be an example of divine mercy. What does it mean they'll trough gold in the streets? That isn't biblical, or at least the King James Version Bible, it's not there. Ricky in North Carolina, was Cain uh, and Abel brothers? Well, they were half-brothers. Uh, Eve was the mother of both. They had different fathers. One was fathered, Cain was fathered by the serpent. Uh, Abel was fathered by Adam. When he killed Abel, it says the evil one. Is it referring to the devil? And even in the New Testament, uh, the first epistle of John, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, it states there, uh, Cain, who was of that evil one. And you know who the evil one is? Uh, that's the devil. And that's exactly who fathered Cain. You won't find Cain in Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. You know why? Because he wasn't his son. Patricia in Georgia, Deuteronomy 32, what do I need to memorize of the Song of Moses. Well, I don't personally have 
the Song of Moses memorized. Uh, I'm very familiar with it and I know what it says. Um, and, and of course it's important to be familiar with that. Uh, why? Because in uh, Revelation 15 verse 3 we learn that the overcomers, uh, those who uh, will not worship the Antichrist, will be singing, singing the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Deuteronomy 32 is where you'll find the Song of Moses. Be familiar with what it says. I don't think that you have to memorize it. Helen in Georgia, if you had an abortion but didn't know God, but now I do and I've repented, can I be forgiven by God for this? What you did is not the unforgivable sin. Um, I know you know that it was wrong what you did and, and not a good thing, but again, it's not the unforgivable sin. Uh, what I would do if I were you is repent, uh, and I know you already have and ask for forgiveness, but then uh, get on with about your business of living your life and serving the Lord. <clears throat> Naphtali from South Carolina, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, on several occasions, you seem to suggest that the fires from the lake of fire burns that person out of existence. If your position is correct, I have uh, some questions. Yeshua speaks of a place of fire where the worm dieth not. If the worm is not incinerated out of existence, how is that the one in whom the worm torments is burned out of existence? And you're referring to the word that's in the New Testament of hell. And that in the Greek language is Gehenna. And you, I can tell you're not familiar with where Gehenna was or what it was. Gehenna is a garbage pit uh, outside of Jerusalem. And people would throw dead animals uh, on this burning fire pit, all kinds of trash and garbage. And that's the worm moving in and out of the carcasses of animals that they threw on there. And the fire never goes out. It just continues to burn and burn and burn. That's what that's talking about there. The lake of fire, on the other hand, as you read about in Revelation chapter, nine, excuse me, yeah, Revelation chapter 19 and 20, uh, that person is uh, up in smoke forever and ever. You follow, if the beast, Antichrist, the false prophet, are cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 19 and 20, for a thousand years only to emerge at the end of the thousand years, how is that a thousand years if the fire did not incinerate them out of existence? You're misunderstanding. Uh, who goes into the lake of fire in Revelation 19 is the beast and the false prophet. That's the Antichrist and the one world political beast go into the lake of fire. Satan, on the other hand, is uh, in the, uh, the bottomless pit chained by Michael until the end of the thousand years, Revelation chapter 20. Then he is released. That's when he goes into the lake of fire is at the end of Revelation 20. But Satan will not have his power of the Antichrist uh, during the thousand years. Some will still follow him into the lake of fire, unfortunately. Carmen in New York, thank you and all your staff. Thank you for your kind comments. My question, how do you know if you are one of God's elect? Uh, I can't read your writing. Or, or are you saved through choosing Jesus as your Savior? And there's nothing wrong with being uh, saved by uh, choosing Jesus as your Savior and believing on Him as long as you're not deceived by the Antichrist. Um, does that mean you're going in the lake of fire if you're deceived by the Antichrist? Well, you're going to have some learning to do through the millennium for sure. If you, and how do you know if you're one of God's elect? I'd say if you know God's overall plan and especially that you understand that the Antichrist comes first. And some have a destiny. They'll be delivered up before the synagogues of Satan uh, for a witness. And that's when the Holy Spirit speaks through them and even the gainsayers will be convinced. 
Linda in Michigan, what does God think of transgender people? Well, I think God probably scratches his head and wonders why they don't look between their legs if they need to determine and they can't figure out if they're male or female. That's what we do with puppies in Arkansas. We look between their legs and that tells us whether they're a male or a female. Philadelphia and Oklahoma, God's commandment is do not take the Lord's name in vain. My question, is that the same as the unpardonable sin? No, that's not the unpardonable sin. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, it isn't the unforgivable sin, but it is a sin. Uh, Jim in Oklahoma, is the house of the Lord Solomon built still standing? If so, where is it? And no, it's not. Uh, the original uh, Solomon's temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Uh, we'll be covering that when we get to Second Chronicles chapter 36. Uh, the second uh, temple, which was built by Ezra and in the time of Nehemiah, when Judah was released from the captivity to the Babylonians, they went back and built the temple. That temple, which was not near as immaculate, was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and the Romans. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. It makes his day when he looks down and he sees you reading the letter that he sent to you, seeking knowledge of him and how for you to be pleasing to him. That makes his day, and when you make your Father's day, the blessings start to flow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others as well. Now, there's one thing, though, that's most important, beloved, and it's this. Stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.